please. If you have your Bible with you today, would you turn to the first chapter of Proverbs? And in a minute, we'll look again at those same verses I read with the children this morning and look a little more in depth at kind of that same idea of how God uses us, particularly mothers, because it's Mother's Day, but not exclusively by any means, um, how God uses those and sort of what our responsibility uh, and what God has invested in us, how we literally wear those uh, things. And so um, I've entitled this sermon, The School of Mom. Um, and being Mother's Day, some of you may have already today opened a card um, that had something like this um, in it. This is kind of stereotypical for a lot of the Mother's Day cards. This one uses the acronym M-O-T-H-E-R. M is for the million things she gave me. O means only that she's growing old. T is for the tears she shed to save me. H is for her heart of purest gold. E is for her eyes with love, light shining. Right is for right, and right she'll always be. Put them all together, and they spell mother, a word that means the world to me. I read this week by where one female writer um, said about cards like that um, to her daughter. She said, don't send me one of those cards this year. I don't want it. And she said, here's why. She said, every year I get one of those cards, and it occurs to me that probably one of two things uh, is happening. I read that and think, that's the kind of mother I should be, but I'm not. Or that I read that and think, that's the kind of mother you wish I was, and you know that I'm really not. And I read that, and at first I thought it was kind of humorous, and then I thought it's really tragic in some ways. But I also understand, as a church and as a preacher, as we prepare for a day like this, we understand that a day like Mother's Day can be a very difficult day for a lot of people. Um, for those who have lost moms, it's a reminder of the pain and loss that we have. For those um, who didn't have children or didn't have the number of children they wanted or, or that having children has not gone the way that you thought it would go and all kinds of things. And I think the Father's Day and even some of the other holidays sometimes bring to the surface pain that's always there in our hearts from time to time. Um, so why is it? It's not just a cultural thing because the Bible, I think, holds in honor moms and dads and families in some kinds of ways. So I don't think the answer to uh, uh, being that sometimes occasions like this bring up pain is to ignore it, but to remind us of what God does in and through people uh, all the time, particularly in moms. Um, so here's what I just want to give you a preview of where we're going with this. We're going to look at the book of Proverbs. We're only going to read three verses. But if you know anything about Proverbs, it is a book about wisdom. In fact, it's a book about how to get wisdom. Um, and some of you know the difference in knowledge and wisdom already. Some of you know people who are very, very smart and have a lot of knowledge in their head, but very little wisdom. And sometimes a simple definition of wisdom could be walking around knowledge, that it's not just facts, but you actually know how to put it into play. But I think biblical wisdom is even a little more than that. And we're going to read from the Proverbs um, what is the beginning of wisdom and then maybe how we are to apply it to our lives. But here's one thing I read in relation to Mother's Day that some of you can attest to the difference in knowledge and wisdom. Good moms and great moms. Good moms let you lick the beaters. Great moms turn them off first. That's some putting into play knowledge, right? Um, it, both of them can be kind acts, but one of them you have to be a lot more careful to get what you're really after there. Well, the book of Proverbs um, points out things like that, is that it's not just knowing about something, but how to use something. And it's interesting how the book of Proverbs works. Um, in fact, I'll put this picture up there for you. If you know anything about Twitter, um, you know that it's one of many social media platforms, but it's unique uh, among lots of the social media platforms because it limits you to 140 characters to post something on there and maybe a picture or a video to go with it. Well, if you know 140 characters, that means letters, spaces, numbers, and everything, that's not a lot of time to say something. And yet, 
people very effectively share all kinds of things on there. Um, pearls of wisdom, or at least perceived in their own mind, the pearls of wisdom they need to dispense to other people. Uh, sometimes, like a lot of social media, I think people try to use it to dispense justice out to other people. They don't tell you what they think and things that you need to hear. Sometimes even it's dispensing venom to whoever will read what you have to say there. But it's in a limited sense. Well, Proverbs is meant to be like that as well. In fact, one author says that the book of Proverbs is God's Twitter feed to the human race. And he compares it like this. With Twitter, you have 140 characters for your message to sum up what's going on in your life. These little messages are short bursts of communication. When you read a tweet, that's what a message on Twitter is called, you're reading a burst of truth about a person's life, activities, observations, or philosophy summed up in 140 characters or less. That's just what we have in the book of Proverbs, giving advice to us in short bursts of communication, usually 140 characters or less per verse. Proverbs is God's divinely, self, uh, d divinely designed self-improvement course, his textbook for learning how to wise up and to live. There's 915 verses in Proverbs, and they represent God's wisdoms for hundreds of situations we step into each day. And I like this phrase. He says, the Proverbs are portable wisdom, heavenly rules for earthly living, and it isn't just data accumulation or brain power. And he says, thumb through 31 chapters of um, Proverbs, and it's always been pointed out to me, um, you know, a lot of months that we have have 30 or 31 days in them. If you read one chapter of Proverbs a day, you would get a pretty good set of wisdom tweets each day. Um, I bet you a lot of you, if you're on Twitter, you read at least 30 tweets a day. And if you divided 915 by 30 or 31, it comes up in the neighborhood of 30. So 30 verses for 30 days um, is a pretty good plan to read something about God's wisdom. But, and all these Proverbs include things like this. They're packed with advice about working hard, eating wisely, watching how much we drink, guarding how much we speak, avoiding unhealthy friendships and immoral sexuality, treating people kindly, handling money well, and making good decisions in matters great and small. Each proverb tells us at least two things, it or one of two things. It teaches us how we will respond to life if we have a healthy fear of the Lord or how we will mess it up if we don't. And so when we move to this first verse that we want to look at today, verse 7 in Proverbs chapter 1 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. That idea of the fear of the Lord gets misrepresented at times, but it is uh, something that Proverbs talks much about. And if Proverbs is about getting wisdom, it says to us the beginning of that is the fear of the Lord. Now, fear is not the terrifying, cowering kind of fear. In fact, A.W. Tozer, you may know his name, defined it like this, and I love this definition. He said, the fear of the Lord is astonished reverence. Now think about that. Astonished reverence. That's a different type of fear. You could describe it as fear, um, but an astonishment that sometimes leaves us speechless, but always leaves us amazed. But it's a reverence that knows who God is. And we know His power, His glory, His majesty, His authority. But it doesn't make us flee. In fact, just the opposite. It attracts us to Him. He goes on to say that I believe reverential fear of God mixed with these things. Love, fascination, astonishment, admiration, and devotion is the most enjoyable state and the most satisfying emotion the human soul can know. Fear of the Lord, astonished reverence, is something that God desires for us. 
God wants us to know him, but to know him in the proper way. You know, we live in a day that it's common for people to go, my idea of what God is or my idea of who Jesus is, and we put our own idol out there, and we want to worship God as we can perceive him to be and more commonly as we would like him to be. And we find out, if you read um, almost any book of the Bible, when God shows up, It's always astonished reverence. It's always fear of the Lord that's first because the presence of God is a fear that opens our eyes to all those things, the glory, majesty, dominion, and authority of God, but it doesn't drive us away like earthly fear does. It draws us to him and we say, I need to know more about him. And even a gracious thing happens. When God shows up, all of a sudden our sin is all we can think about is a holy God comes into our presence, we're aware that we are not like him. And there is a healthy understanding of God's justice and judgment, but it's tempered by his offer of grace and love in Jesus Christ. You know, there's um, another author that says, if we ask what's the basis and the beginning and the integrating theme of the father's instruction and a mother's teaching... What is it that runs through all their daily modeling and counseling and explaining and correcting and disciplining that give unity and meaning to it all? The answer is the fear of the Lord. I want to talk a little bit about how um, families invest in each other, particularly those in authority, parents, grandparents, uh, whatever uh, guardians God has set over us, how God uses them to invest something very important in us and how difficult that can be. But also, it's often difficult in our lives because it doesn't begin where it has to begin with our own fear of the Lord, with our own astonished reverence before God. So, this is the advice that Proverbs gives to a child. In fact, Proverbs often says, my son, and as I said to the children, that can mean my son, my daughter, whoever you are, it's speaking to you, and it says this, listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland to grace your head, and a chain to adorn your neck. You know, it goes all the way back to the law in Moses' day, honor your father and mother, and it will go well with you, and you will live long in the land. One of the Ten Commandments is to honor your father and mother, and if it, whatever else it means, it certainly means to obey those in authority over us, particularly the family members who are in authority over you. And It's always occurred to me as a father, as I'm sure it has a view of fathers or mothers or whatever you are, that um, that's a high and difficult calling. And sometimes we have to act in ways, not because it's our natural instinct, is because if we have a fear of the Lord, we treat those who we are given authority over, those who are our responsibility, we do it what God wants us to do, not necessarily what I want us to do. And I think I've even said this overtly to my children. I think it's a healthy thing to remind sometimes. A lot of times when my kids have done something, the very last thing we want to do as parents is to have to punish them. Punish them. Punishment can be a giant headache for parents in case, children, you didn't realize that. Sometimes it's more difficult for parents. I don't mean physical punishment. I mean if we ground you, we have to live with you in the same house for a while, right? That can be more difficult than not punishing. But... If children are a gift from God, then we bear a responsibility to raise them as a gift of God. That we're really, uh, that they're on loan to us from God. And he expects us to give them back in better condition than we receive them. And again, what a difficult calling that is. How could anybody be up for that task? How could any of us not feel like that one particular mother is, I don't want a card that says all the glowing things a mother ought to be, or a father or whoever we might be, and say, I know I don't live up to that. I appreciate the gesture and giving me this card, but I know that's not who I really am. So what are we to do when we feel inadequate for the task? 
Well, let's be reminded of the blessings that doing what God has called us to do as guardians over our children, as mothers, fathers, particularly as mothers today, will focus in because of the day. It says that if we will teach our children those things, and this takes for granted, it says listen to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. It takes for granted that the father's instruction and the mother's teaching are according to God's word. And we'll read some more about that um, in just a minute. But if we will do those things, if we will accept and be obedient to that teaching, it says that they will be, those, uh, that obedience, that wisdom that we get because of it, will be like a crown on our heads and a chain around our neck. And I look out here at this congregation, as over these years that I've been here, I've gotten to know some of you well and some of you very well. But a whole bunch of you, in fact, most of you, I've never known those people who invested in you. Some of you have shared stories about your own mothers and fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers, aunts and uncles, uh, pastors, Sunday school teachers, youth directors, and people like that. I've never known almost any of those people personally, but I see them all over you all the time. Because many of you wear that garland on your head and that chain around your neck. They are signs that wisdom has been imparted to you and you have taken that up and you wear it daily. What a great picture of that. I looked all over the internet the last two days trying to find the right picture to represent that and it doesn't exist, I don't think, because there is not a picture that is as glorious as someone who has adorned the wisdom and the fear of the Lord. You can't take a snapshot of that, but it's all over people everywhere. And I see so much of that in our congregation. I see so much of that in men and women and even children all over the place that they have taken up that precious wisdom that's been given, often through the family. And when it says it's a garland or a crown, that is a reward and a prize, and it's meant to designate the winner. In fact, in a couple of the recent Olympic games, they've gone back to doing this. Way back in the Greek times, in the early years of the Olympics, that was all you got. You didn't get a gold medal. You got uh, some woven branches put upon your head. But boy, you got to wear that proudly. And then... Um, this gold chain around your neck is more familiar to us as a prize is some of you have competed in things uh, where you get something to go around your neck. Sometimes even gold. I've gotten a few of those, but I don't think any of them were actually gold. They were more like gold painted or something like that. But it designates that you have achieved something, that you are being rewarded for an accomplishment. Wisdom works like that. We wear it as a crown and as a chain around us. And people ought to notice that in us. And maybe they don't know those people who have invested that in us. But what a glorious prize it is that we show to the world. And how does God use those things so often? Well, I want to say just a word about the school of mom, particularly because the Bible mentions a mother and a grandmother um, who were part of investing this and what great reward we see and what benefits were reaped by many of us even today from this um, young man. There was a young man named Timothy. And he was a colleague of Paul. He was a young pastor that Paul was beginning to invest in. And in the book of 2 Timothy, Paul reminds Timothy of something. He says this, 1 Timothy 1.5 says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. I wonder how long it would take us. Some of you have been uh, attending church, Sunday school, Bible school, all that from the time you were a little bitty. Some of you have been teaching and sharing in the church all this long. If I said, let's make a list of the top 500 Bible characters, how long would it take you to get to the names Eunice or Lois? You know those people? We don't know almost anything else about them. And yet, they were responsible for investing in a young man named Timothy. From infancy, we're going to be told, they invested the word of God in him. 
And he became one of the men who was charged with writing down the very word of God, of pastoring those early churches in the days after Jesus. And he says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother and your mother and was passed on to you. You see, faith like that is not inherited, it's passed on. And we've been reminded of that before is that in a family setting and even in our church setting, you don't automatically get that like you get your hair color, your eye color, or any of those kinds of things. It's something that has to be passed on. It has to be invested in others. Well, this is what Paul goes on to say in 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. He says, but as for you, he's speaking to Timothy again, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it, speaking of Eunice and Lois, his grandmother and his mother, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith. In Jesus Christ. You see what wisdom does? True wisdom leads us to faith in Jesus Christ. True wisdom is not worn as an accomplishment to be bragged upon. Look at me how great I am. True wisdom causes us to walk in the steps of Jesus Christ. It includes humility and love and sacrifice and all the things that we are called to do. And so finally... What is it that we need to learn to do ourselves so that we can pass on to others? And I want to remind us, I'm not speaking only here of mothers or fathers. You know, the church is considered to be a family of God too. There's not a single person here today that isn't charged with the same thing that Eunice and Lois and anybody else is charged with is to fear the Lord to be wise in our own ways and invest that in other people. But particularly um, today, because it is Mother's Day, I want to encourage our moms with, with something um, that I read from an author named Sarah Walton. And the title of her book is called Weak Moms, Strong God. And it reminds us of a high calling. And if you're one of those moms who opened a card this morning and thought, you know, that's really nice, but I'm not sure I'm up to that kind of task. I wish I could be that kind of mom. Here is Sarah Walton's advice to you and three things she says that I think are worth passing on. And again, I think this could apply to many of us who aren't moms, but particularly I want to encourage moms with this. First, she says, um, uh, what do our children need in order to learn the fear of the Lord so that they can be wise in the way they live? First, she says, our children need a mom who loves Jesus more than the mom who does everything right. Anybody here think you've been a mom that's done everything right? Well, there's some encouragement to go, well, I'm no worse than anybody else. Truth is, you are worse than somebody else. Truth is also, you probably are better than someone else. Is that all that matters? Well, I think her point here is that if we love Jesus more than we love doing things exactly right, God will accomplish that purpose in us despite maybe our failings. In fact, she says this, we will fail our children. And maybe that's a good message to children here too. Some of you live that out is our parents will fail us because they're not perfect. But she goes on to say whether we overreact, overprotect, waste our time, pass on a bad habit, discipline and anger, or neglect to discipline, we will make mistakes. And sin will be intermingled with even our best efforts. Trying to be the perfect mother for our children will always leave us discouraged, guilt-ridden, and weary. Our children need us to stop fixating on our successes and failures and start fixing our gaze on Christ. There's no greater encouragement to us. How do I begin the process of passing on the fear of the Lord and the wisdom that I want them to have? Is that we love Jesus above all else even our own sense of accomplishment and doing things right. So first, a mom who loves Jesus more than doing everything right. Secondly, our children need a mom who humbles herself under God's loving plan, even when it's not her own. Now think about that, and I forgot I had these up here so you could see them. A mom who loves Jesus more than a mom who does everything right, and a mom who humbles herself 
under God's loving plan, even when it's not her own. Is that maybe one of the most difficult things in our life is that we look out before us and we have all these designs on what our life should be like. Not just in parenting, but in almost any area of life. And being able to humble ourselves enough to say, God's plan may be different than mine. In fact, God's plan might not be as self-satisfying to me as mine was, but it's always a bigger and a greater plan. Third thing, be a mom who trusts that God is bigger than our baggage, our failures, and our circumstances. And she says something very powerful to me. She says, what a powerful witness it is to our children when they see peace and joy flowing from their mom amidst challenging circumstances and their own rebellious hearts. And what a greater gift we can give our children, what greater gift can we give our children than to give them a glimpse of a trustworthy Savior who is greater than our sin and greater than our trials. You know, that's really what the Christian life is about, is admitting that God is great and I am not. Why can't we do that in our parenting, in our investment in other people, to say, I want to do what God wants me to do, but there are times when I'm going to fail and fail miserably to that. And maybe that's a message our children need to hear from us, that we can admit, I'm not always going to get it right, but God always will. And I can trust his plan for that. I can trust his provision for my children, not because I can do it all, but because God will do it all. Proverbs 31, 30 says this, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Notice it doesn't say perfect wives and mothers and grandmothers are to be praised. Praised. Who is to be praised? The woman who fears the Lord. The man who fears the Lord. The child who fears the Lord. The disciple of Jesus Christ who fears the Lord is to be praised. They're not perfect. They don't always even know what God is doing in every moment, but they trust Him. And one last scripture I didn't put up on the screen for us, but Psalm 147 reminds us about the strength of the Lord and our lack of it, but what really matters. It, Psalm 147.10 says, His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of the warrior. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And I would say the beginning of the fear of the Lord is to understand God's unfailing love. That he is a God who loves you unimaginably. And he works not just in spite of our failures, but through our failures. And that you have not just the responsibility, it is a responsibility, but you have the privilege to pass on the fear of the Lord to somebody, somewhere, somehow. And when we do that... We are demonstrating that crown and that chain around our neck that we wear godliness and discipline and obedience before the Lord as a reward and we get to pass those on. As one king passes down the crown to another, so we get to do the same. I hope we're encouraged in that, we're challenged in that today and that we can remember that the one who fears the Lord is to be praised. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, it is with great joy that we come to you this day, that we are reminded of our need for Jesus, that we are sinners in your sight, and yet you have given your very self, your Holy Spirit, to live in us, and that you can accomplish great and mighty things to us. Even such an um, uh, insurmountable task as raising children can be done in us and through us. And we can do that through the wisdom and through the fear of the Lord. I pray that your unfailing love would be poured out upon us today, that we would come humbly before you and we could seek to do your will uh, in every aspect of our lives. I pray that we would wear that crown of wisdom and that chain around our neck in a way that points to the wisdom and the knowledge that comes only in relationship with the true and the living God. And so that's our prayer today, and we ask you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.